I mentioned previously that I noticed a mood boost from taking neutralized vinegar. I didn't expect this to happen, and I wasn't sure why acetate would affect mood, but I looked around and found there's at least one study using it in this manner with positive results. But first I want to talk about a nice comment I received. I was talking about the illusion of safe air travel, and I pointed out that while air travel is safe on a mile per mile basis, you go a heck of a lot more miles on a plane, and each individual long trip is not really that safe. A guy responded with this nice comment telling me how few people understood this. Since he has math in his very username, this guy should probably know. So thank you for recognizing my brilliance, finally. Well now that the good is out of the way, on to the bad. This video is truly a roller coaster, I know, I know. I hate the site Quora, partly because it forces you to log in to read answers, partly because Google always puts it close to the top in search results, even though it's a totally useless website with no real info on it. But mainly I hate it because the answers are just so annoyingly smug and utterly useless. So this poor guy, not me, asks how vinegar improves depression, and this smug know-it-all piece of garbage writes in very certain language why this is impossible, and that only a large double-blind re randomized control trial with placebo control group could show this, and if no one provided a link to it, then they're a liar. Now there have been trials about vinegar, that's part of the problem here. Just having the wrong answer there is bad enough. And even more than that, the big thing here is people will answer with certainty something that they haven't done any research on. Don't waste people's time. You can easily look up whether something has been studied or not, but I constantly get people demanding links for things. You can look up for in two seconds and trying to argue with me, even though sometimes they're arguing with me when I've already posted it in a link within the post itself and they just didn't read it. But the real reason I'm talking about it is because there's a bigger issue with the nonsense notion that clinical trials done by Big Pharma are needed for scientific exploration. And if people think that, that's a big problem because those things cost like a billion dollars to run. When you calculate a confidence interval, it takes into consideration your sample size. A confidence interval of 95% is just as valid if the sample size is 30 or if the sample size is 200,000. So if any math genius out there puts this forward, it just shows they have no idea what they're talking about. Only at very small sample sizes is there an issue, and even an experiment of one can have very important results, especially if you get an impossible one, such as reversing arterial plaque or reversing type 2 diabetes, which we've heard ad nauseum are impossible to reverse, but people have done it over and over again, and now we have bigger studies showing it's possible, so they kind of grudgingly admit it without publicizing it because they don't really want you to know you can reverse it because they want to make money off of your death. Your very slow, painful death through type 2 diabetes where you're spending $1,000 a month on insulin. And what's worse is if you have a large sample size that gives you a lot of information about the effect size. So if you need thousands of people to detect something is happening, then we know the effect size is absolutely tiny. So if you're taking a certain drug everyone is being coerced into taking that had to have a sample size of 20,000 people and a control size of 20,000 people just to detect whether there's an effect size or not, you can just know right then it's a useless quack medicine that doesn't actually do anything. So why are you taking it? Now you also need a large cohort to detect side effects, which are common in meds. But all too many meds today have little or no real beneficial effect, yet they're marketed in terms of relative risk that makes it sound like they have a very large effect. Statins are the number one thing here that comes to mind, but there's lots like that now because they don't have to really prove it has a certain level, a certain threshold that it does things. They just have to prove it does something, anything, which is kind of ridiculous and it's not how it used to work. 
So don't get conned into thinking Big Pharma style medicine is the only valid science. It's not more valid, and it's typically less valid. Thankfully, in spite of all the wrong information, I didn't give up there. Even though I had to wade through several pages of useless garbage to find a study on vinegar and depression. It's always hard to measure depression, but these seem to be surprisingly good results. Especially considering it costs nothing and has little or no side effects. Unlike most meds for the purpose, which have terrible side effects. In spite of this, they're given out like candy. Okay, we'll do something about that right away. Let's start by doubling your medication. I also found a study on vinegar reducing blood pressure. This is actually a meta-analysis, so it's pretty solid that this is a very real thing that happens. And again, the effect size is really quite good here, especially for something that's basically free. When I was taking blood pressure meds, I had to take three of them, and each one gave me about the same effect as 30 milliliters of vinegar would have. Now, the only issue with vinegar is the acidity, but I explained in a previous video exactly how to neutralize it with potassium bicarbonate. In short, half a teaspoon of potassium bicarbonate neutralizes about 30 milliliters of vinegar. I like to actually use only 15 to 20 milliliters and thereby raise my pH a bit, which is good for the kidneys. But if all you want is neutralized in product, then it's half a teaspoon for 30 milliliters. What's even more interesting is I found a study which not only theorized, but proved the mechanism of action of vinegar. I basically knew this had to happen because that's just what happens when you burn fat and this forces you to burn fat, but it's nice to have confirmation. Vinegar is actually a short chain fatty acid, just like butyrate, which you hear so many people babbling on and on about. And you can probably assume all of the great things you hear attributed to butyrate will work for vinegar, except more so. That's because vinegar is the more pure form of what your body wants. It's the exact thing that goes into the Krebs cycle, unlike butyrate, which has to be processed a little bit. You're also going to be able to take many, many times more vinegar than the paltry amount of butyrate, which you could produce in your own gut or get from food. They go on and on about butyrate, but they don't tell you you can only get this tiny fraction of a gram of butyrate per day. It's kind of ridiculous. In a nutshell, burning fat, including from ketones, upregulates AMPK. This in turn drives PPAR gamma. This tells the cells to take fatty acids into the cell, and that makes the cell try to burn it off. The cell has no choice in this when it comes to vinegar because it goes right through the membrane of the mitochondria, unlike most fatty acids. It must respond by upregulating fat burning, which has many great health effects such as removing insulin resistance and removing fat. This in turn upregulates adiponectin. This is a very huge marker for health, and people with high adiponectin always show great markers in other areas too and are always much more healthy than average and it also helps with the weight loss process usually this marker is just that a marker you can't really do anything to budget except lose weight the fact you can actually move this marker with a supplement in short is why i'm so positive about vinegar a diponectin itself also helps to drive fat burning and weight loss and it suppresses hunger. A drug that did this would make someone endless billions of dollars. In fact, many of them that do make billions of dollars do this in an indirect way like metformin and so on, and that's why they cause weight loss. But here you have it in the form of common table vinegar without all the crazy side effects you get from metformin like poisoning your mitochondria, making you unable to absorb nutrients, and on and on and on. Vinegar has also been shown to have interesting effects when it comes to cancer. When cells become insulin resistant, they become full of these DAGs, which are a pathogenic form of fatty acid caused by overloaded cells, reversing the Krebs cycle. They clog up the cell and interfere with the burning of carbohydrate, which causes more and more reverse Krebs action. 
but the cell is unable to burn fat generally due to high insulin. What happens is the short chain fatty acid forces the mitochondria to burn fat because it skips through the typical transport chain right into the mitochondria. This causes the burning of these DAGs because you're switching into fat burning mode and this clears the insulin resistance. So it's no surprise that this can be helpful in dementia, cancer, depression, weight loss, and many other issues. It's really a miracle. At one Chinese vinegar factory, it was noted that the workers had extremely low levels of cancer. Researchers were shocked and they theorized that this was the acidity because acidity is involved in cancer. But since we have confirmation of other mechanisms, I doubt that was the actual cause. In another study, vinegar supplementation increased the immune response of the body towards cancer cells. Which again makes sense because it will restore functionality to your immune cells by the same mechanism insulin sensitivity is restored to your other cells. There's also studies on apple cider vinegar for colon cancer and many other surprising applications. So unlike the crank at the beginning of all of this who was saying it's all nonsense, there's an amazing body of research showing that vinegar is a very important thing that we could all be using to restore our health. Vinegar also increases the AMP to ATP ratio in the cell and this is where the anti-aging part comes in. This is basically going to rescue aging mitochondria by providing more of the functional substrate they need. This is the same idea with most anti-aging supplements like inamin, oxaloacetate, alpha-ketoglutarate, and so on. Generally, they are very expensive supplements because they know that people are willing to pay to live longer, at least hope to live longer. Though in reality, you could almost certainly use the cheaper niacin in place of inamin and the very cheap AAKG in place of calcium AKG. And there's still no studies that actually look at lifespan, say in flies or C. elegans worms or whatever. But the chemistry here shows it's going to have a similar effect to these other substances. 